What's happening, Hardscapers? This is episode 146 of the How to Hardscape podcast, where we talk about how you can start and grow your hardscaping business. And today we have a special episode with Joe and Carla of Cycle CPA. They take over today's episode to talk financial key performance indicators in our industry. If you haven't listened to the few latest episodes on the How to Hardscape podcast, they have been bringing you these episodes. They've been sponsoring the How to Hardscape podcast, and we thank them so much for that. Cycle CPA has a team of accountants that provide anything from bookkeeping to CFO services. And if you've fallen behind or become over overwhelmed with the financial aspects of your business, you can go check them out at cyclecpa.com. Mention the How to Hardscape podcast and get $200 off. One of the great things about them is not only the education that they provide this industry, including their Facebook group, Landscaping Accountant, and the information that they offer there, but also that they specialize in our industry, which is key when it comes to your financials and benchmarking and so much more. And they bring you even more value in today today's episode as they take it over here. So without further ado, let's give it away to Joe and Carla. We're excited to take over the How to Hardscape podcast today. I'm here along with Carla from Cycle CPA, and I'm Joe, uh, the other co-founder. And we're going to go over some main financial KPIs, key performance indicators within the hardscape industry. And to kick things off, we're going to go over cash flow and more more specifically net cash flow. So Carla, how would you define net cash flow? Yeah, so I think an easy way to think about it is if you look at your ending balance in the bank statement. So uh, right now we're in May. So if you were to look at your April's bank statement, the ending balance would be your beginning balance for May 1st. And then throughout May, you're going to have cash inflows. So those are deposits. Um, if you contribute money to the business, uh, loan inflows, maybe you just got some funding, anything that would be considered cash inflows. And so that increases the beginning balance in the bank account. And then we have cash outflows. Those are the things that decrease uh, the cash uh, bank account. So those things would be your expenses, um, you know, if you, you're taking money out of the business. And the difference between your cash inflows for that month and your cash outflows, that would be your net cash flow. So let's say for the month of May, you have more cash inflows than you did cash outflow, then that's a positive cash flow. That's going to increase your bank account. Your ending balance is gonna be higher than it was in your April ending balance. But in a scenario where you had more cash outflows coming out of the business, then that's a negative cash flow for that month. And that means that your ending balance is going to be less than, in, in May than it was in April. Um, so the the reason why net cash flow is important is because we always want to be net cash flow positive. You want to think of it as a cycle, like a washer and dryer cycle. You want your cash inflows to wash your cash outflows, and you don't want to be in a negative cash flow situation, right? Because um, if that happens one month, right, for whatever reason, that's okay. But if it keeps happening, then that could be a downward spiral for your business and, uh, you know, rapidly deplete the cash funds in your bank account. Great. And, you know, a lot of people may may have a good idea in regard to what what profit and loss is, right? And some of the expenses and and the income for you know the profit and loss and um, how that may influence you know your your bank balance. But um, what are some some items that maybe aren't within your profit and loss that that have a huge effect with with cash flow? Oh yeah. Um, so let's say you have a truck loan. Um, or you're paying off some equipment that you're financing, those payments that are coming out of your account monthly, those are not on your profit and loss. Those are on your balance sheet. Um, And other items are things like um, owner's draws. 
So if you're taking money out of the business to pay yourself, that's also um, not on the profit and loss. Now, your salary, like if you run payroll for yourself, that would be on the profit and loss, but not your owner's draws. Um, so those are uh, some of the major things that affect the balance sheet, but not the profit and loss. And this is another reason why. So your profit and loss, a lot of uh, business owners that I talk to say, well, why doesn't my profit match what's in my bank statement? And that's exactly why. It's because you don't have all of the items reflected in the profit and loss. Um, some are in the balance sheet. Great. So even, even looking at items like accounts receivable, the money that is owed to you, and then your accounts payable, the money that you owe others, making sure that you know, if, if you aren't receiving money as quick as you would like, you want to make sure that you improve that process. For instance, you want to look at the process and the expectation, not only that you have when it comes to collecting this and that expectation upfront with the customer, but you also want to make sure that if you have team members and administrative employees in in house that are handling the accounts receivable process and calling people, emailing people, is there automations involved with that? Are you sending out automated emails? Do you know exactly when you're going to contact the customers to try to collect the money? Because many people are very hyper focused when it comes to all right, I need to recoup these material expenses. I need to make sure that I recoup my, my overhead expenses in the estimates. But when it comes down to the, the cash, right, the, the cash that um, your, your net cash at the end of a period, when you look at things like accounts receivable or some of your other current assets, you know, or, or current liabilities, you know, those items have just as big of an effect on the health of your business financially. So it's important to look at that as a whole. Yeah, and it comes down to, I believe, a couple of things um, in order to have positive cash flow. So it's, it's simple, but you wanna match your revenues and your expenses within um, as close proximity within the time period as you can. So if you're going to render services for your client, uh, you know, during this week, it would be ideal if you receive the money as close as possible as you're rendering the service because when you're rendering the service, you're going to have to pay for the materials. You're going to have to pay for the labor expenses. And so if you can get those deposits to match your outflows as close as possible, that's when you'll have an ideal situation. Obviously, you know, sometimes the real work, the real world doesn't work that way. And so that's when you could leverage um, some relationships with your vendors. So maybe uh, you've established a good relationship with a vendor that you purchase a lot of materials from. You can establish some trade credit with them and maybe um, pay them uh, 15 or 30 days later when you're receiving the money from that service. Um, another point is that profitability, it's important in any business, but especially within the hardscape industry, because uh, cash flow, you know, it is low. And so uh, pricing your jobs as accurately as possible to meet those profit goals is going to directly help increase your cash flow. Because in, in other service lines, let's say lawn maintenance or other reoccurring models, um, there, there isn't as much, um, you know, upfront you know, heavy material costs. Right. So in order to make sure that you have the, the cash available and the resources available, mm -hmm. that means that you're going to have to make sure even more right. that you're going to have the, that net profit to, to, you know, make sure you can cover those um, cash, cash outflows. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I guess to, to now shift over to an, another really important KPI, and that's labor efficiency, both looking at the direct labor efficiency, so the, your team members working in the field, and then also looking at your administrative and management labor efficiency, basically everyone else, anyone that's not actually physically working on the jobs. 
and con combined, those typically, you know, with, with your direct labor and indirect labor, that can be 40 to 50% of your total revenue as a business. So, you know, as a, you know, even working with more than 150 landscape and hardscape businesses, um, it's, it's one thing that, that we always focus on. And it's one of the most important KPIs to look at mm -hmm. because labor is what drives this industry. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the number one thing that you, you need to make sure that you're being efficient with and even understanding that, yes, it's nice to understand you're operating at a certain revenue, but also looking at, you know, all of the different line items and looking at labor, right? Looking at the trend as a percent to revenue, even more specifically, you can look at it, you know, even after a lot of your pass through expenses with, within your cost of goods and really separating it out to, to make sure that you have a clear picture in, in, in how your, your team members are, are working out in the field. And there's many different approaches because sometimes you, you may think, okay, my, my gross margin isn't as high as, as I want it. Um, and you may automatically go to in increase pricing, let's say, you know, you, you may try to solve the problem like that, but you always want to make sure and keep an eye on labor efficiency, because if your competitors are outperforming you in, in the field, then they're going to be able to price their jobs better. And as you raise your prices, you know, that you may potentially be losing out on some jobs. So look at your labor efficiency, whether your goal for management labor is 10% of your revenue for, um, for your direct labor or, or field labor, whether it's 30% of your revenue, you know, keeping, keeping those, those numbers in check. Also understanding that if you're operating different kinds of jobs, if you're shifting away from working on, on, on smaller jobs, maybe 1,000 to, you know, 10,000 jobs. Now you're shifting from, you know, 10,000 to $50,000 jobs. Yeah. Understand that there's different, um, there, there are many differences when it comes to those models and it can affect your, your labor efficiency. So if you're doing similar jobs, every single day, it's going to be a lot easier to track it in relation to other businesses that have different service lines, different divisions, they're, they're doing different kinds of jobs. It'll make it a little more difficult, but you know, in, in either, um, either circumstance, it's something that, that, that you really want to really want to focus on. And also understanding that, you know, some companies optimize in different ways. Some companies may have very effective management, you know, and, and they may be very good leaders and they may be very good at training um, and they may be very efficient where they can handle, um, you know, all of the management and administrative tasks uh, at maybe, let's say, 8% of, of total revenue. But maybe their direct labor in that company is, is not as efficient. So instead of maybe being at, let's say 30% um, of, of total revenue, maybe they're a little bit higher, let's say 35%. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they work together as a team to make sure that they hit their gross margin and net profit goals. Whereas another company may have a totally different setup where their management is not as um, solid and, and, and as efficient, mm -hmm. but they're able to get people trained faster and they're, you know, they try to find people that have a little bit more experience in the field and, you know, have direct labor that can operate very efficiently. So yeah. there are different approaches with, with companies. And that's why sometimes, that's why with a lot of our clients, we, we do the benchmarking. Um, we, we build that into our services because we, we like to at least have a, have a set, um, you know, area where, where, where we can say, all right, you know, you may be able to work, you know, a little bit more efficient in this area. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, in this area, you're, you're looking pretty good. Yeah. And what I have seen is that in a scenario where a business owner is not happy with their labor uh, percentage to sales, let's say if it was 45%, right? That's, that's pretty, pretty high. Um, the, 
the labor is 45% of their total sales. And so with that, you know, it could be a pricing issue or it could be um, inefficiencies um, and some other things. But those are the two major um you know problems that it could it could be so with that you want to also measure revenue per hour because that will help you narrow down maybe what the problem area is maybe you feel that your field labor is is being as efficient as they as they can be so um in that circumstance maybe it's a pricing issue but really measuring this with the revenue per hour is going to get you a better picture um, and the revenue per hour, how we calculate it uh, for the business owners that we work with is um, taking your revenue and then pulling your payroll reports, whether you use ADP or Gusto, uh, pulling those reports for the period that you're looking at your profit and loss. So for example, January through April, um, you pull your payroll reports and it should have the amount of hours the direct field labor staff work during that period. And so you have your sales, you divide that by your direct labor hours, and let's say you come up with something like $40 an hour. And you say to yourself, well, well, we have business owners saying, well, hey, uh, I don't charge $40 an hour. On average, I think I charge 65. And it's not matching what's your, what it's saying on your profit and loss. And that's because then that results um, to a estimating problem because you're not recouping all your costs and so you're needing to imp increase your pricing. Yeah. So that's where you could really hone in on what the problem area is. And with the revenue per hour, what's nice about that is that let's say you calculate it um, each month, you know, and you start incorporating these different changes, um, you, you know, tie, tie, uh, tie up some loose ends in your estimating process. And then the next month you calculate it again. If that number, if the re uh, revenue per hour starts increasing, then you know you're getting closer to where your estimating needs to be. Yeah. And each, each part of the country is going to have a different revenue per hour. Oh yeah. So, you know, and you know, whether it's a hundred dollars per hour in, you know, one area, it may be different in another area because even if you look at, for instance, paying out a, a, uh, you know, paying, paying an employee, um, let's say paying them plus labor burden is $25, uh, per year. Um, you know, and if your goal is, let's say, for your labor to be, um, you know, 25% of, of your total revenue, then you know your your hourly rate is going to be roughly $100 an hour. So it's it's a good, you know, it's something you can look at it just as a bird's eye view. Yeah. Uh, but it, it also gives you a good idea into whether you're actually recouping all of your expenses within your, your, your estimates. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of business owners fall short with their overhead costs. They don't know their true overhead costs. And I think that that's really where um, the problem area lies. And when I say overhead costs, uh, I'm talking about advertising, marketing, your overhead staff salaries, um, things of that nature. And you shouldn't also, you should incorporate depreciation on your vehicle's equipment, because as those wear and tear, you want to recoup for those items so that you can purchase, you know, uh, more when the time is right. So. Absolutely. And to, to move on to the next, um, you know, key performance indicator, you know, looking at net profit, it's a, it's a common term thrown around the industry. And first off, you know, just, just understanding that the difference between gross profit and, and net profit Gross profit is is what's what's left over after all of your direct expenses, after your materials, direct labor in the field, um, equipment rentals, uh, disposal fees. So all of those expenses, then then what's left over, you you have to pay your your overhead expenses, and then what's left over after that, then that's what your net profit is. And we touched on it briefly before about how it's super important to 
Uh, make sure that you're making a high net profit yeah. in in a hardscape business because there are a lot of those those upfront costs and a lot of those times when you're going to have to be paying um, for for materials and and other um, job job related expenses before you're actually paid by the customer. Um, so looking at at net profit as as of as a priority to to focus on, mm -hmm. making sure that you have it broken down. If you have more than one division, more than one service line, understanding your profits in each is is extremely important because then you'll have a better idea in how to um, approach. You know how can we become more efficient, or is it worth to expand in a certain division? Sometimes it could be difficult if if you don't know where you are profitable within your business. Yeah. Um, and if you don't know that, and if you try to scale, you may be just multiplying more problems for yourself and, you know, it may put you in a deeper and deeper hole. Yeah. And I think as business owners, sometimes we just are concerned with looking at the top line revenue number and, you know, seeing that increase is, is definitely great, but you know, as that increases, so should your net profit percentage increase. So if your business is growing revenue um, at, let's say your growth uh, rate is 10% uh, revenue growth, then your net profit should be 10% net profit growth okay because let's say if you're growing revenue at 10 percent, but you only you're only growing net profit at five percent um then some of those inefficiencies or overspending on overhead items and so on kind of trickles down there and so that's why sometimes a growth uh, for growth sake is not is not good because if you don't have the right systems and policies in places for your employees and for them to follow as you grow and scale the business, the more inefficiency um, that you're going to see and the more that that multiplies out. Yeah, and also looking at, you know, especially in these times when there's a lot of supply issues or um, there's the materials expenses have been very high or other other direct expenses right. increasing mm -hmm. you want to make sure that your that it's not um that that your net profit is not being affected by that those are expenses that you have to pass on to your customer right. at, at the end of the day yeah and it's extremely important to look at your month-to-month -month financials and even you know we're we're approaching the half year mark here in 2022 looking back and seeing okay how how does this um, year to date financials these past six months how does that compare to last year during that time because you want to see improvements each year so that's something to take a look at also using net profit to hold you accountable it's very easy to increase revenue you can go out and get jobs um, and you can win jobs if you're not building in profits um, but it's not a scalable approach a long-term approach is to make sure that you're building in profits to your jobs, you're working with the right customers, um, and for instance, looking at things like marketing spend. This is something that a lot of companies, they can probably do better at within, within the hardscape industry, and even being more aggressive with, because, you know, but, but one thing to understand is that if you spend a certain amount on marketing for the year, let's say it's 50,000, you want to make sure that you get at least a 50% return on that extra spend. Yeah. Um, and holding your team accountable to not only what a lot of marketers like to look at is your, um, you know, the certain revenue or the certain sales figures that they can increase by. It's important to instead focus on your net profits. Right. Um, that's the priority because if you're going to continue to grow, you're going to be using those net profits um, to ultimately fund your future growth. Also looking at things within sales. If you have a sales team or if you're the person doing sales, hold yourself or your team accountable, not as much to the um, total revenue that that salesperson brings in, but instead focus on the net profit that they generate. Yeah. Why? Because it'll help them communicate better within your entire team. They'll want to talk to your admin staff who are collecting <laughs> that money, making sure that you know they're getting the cash flow in and their commission. 
also talking closely with the, with the field labor employees, making sure that you know they're they're working or that the salesperson is taking on jobs that the field labor can operate efficiently. Right. Because if if the salesperson is not taking on the specific jobs that the field labor can work efficiently with, then it's going to hurt your net profit. Yeah. Revenue will will stay the same. So that's why it's important to focus on net profit. A lot of the balance sheet KPIs, like return on assets mm -hmm. um, or or return on, on equity, your net profit is part of that equation. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge aspect of your business and um, you know, definitely something to keep as a priority. Yeah, and I like how you said that business owners should, tr should tie that um, with your sales staff because if maybe you tie their commissions to the net profit, now they have a sense of responsibility for the whole profit and loss side, all the way down to overhead costs. So, um, you know, I know if, if that's what, you know, I relied on, I'm going to be sure I'm looking at the profit and loss, estimating my jobs for profitability each and every time. So I think that that's a great point. And, um, you know, another thing that I want to point out is well, one of the biggest expenses that I see just increases um, with, with some of the business as they're growing and scaling is the overhead salaries. So, so, so that's, that's management salaries and, uh, administrative sales. Uh, administrative sales mechanics all of that um and so i think what ends up happening is that the business owner is not creating good processes um in place and they're seeing that they're getting inundated with administrative tasks or just work and then you get into a habit it's like okay well i have this x amount of work to do let me hire another um manager um and then you get into a bad habit of filling that void with an extra person. And really, the first thing you want to do when you are feeling that way is looking at the processes within the business and seeing how maybe you can leverage technology first or you can just uh, put a process in place that's going to help you save time and maybe leverage your staff that you already have in-house. Because sometimes when you you see an increase in workload, that doesn't always mean, okay, I'm going to hire another person. And so we've, uh, I know I've seen business owners where they've gotten into that bad habit and now their overhead salaries are at 15 or 20% of revenue. And it's uh, really hard to climb out of that hole. Absolutely. And think in terms of, you know, all right, what are some things that I can do that are maybe not common in the industry, but can improve my, my margins. Is there remote staff that you can utilize, whether it's designer or if it's a outsourced HR team um, or outsourced payroll, outsourced, um, you know, so there's, there's many different aspects, not just outsourced bookkeeping and CFO <laughs> services that like we offer, but there's yeah. many different avenues that, that you can go through to try to reduce that management labor cost yep and you can be more creative with that because your your direct labor they have to be at that location right um but for some of your administrative and you know, administrative staff you know right. think about ways that that you can um you know manage that better right um, and then you know i'd like to also move on to our our next KPI, which is return on equity. So moving yep. into the balance sheet a little bit here, um, actually combined. So it's yeah, you know, taking your net profit divided by your total equity. Yeah, net profit divided by your equity. And so um, because you are a business owner, obviously you got into the business to make money and, and have a high return on on owning a business it's it's risky it's hard work a lot of sweat equity up front so you want to make sure you're tracking this at least um on a quarterly basis just because you know month to month you might not see a lot of change but so quarterly uh but like uh joe said it's your net profit divide that by your equity and so we like to see this anywhere at least 40 to 50 percent uh return uh 
And so things that are going to increase your your return on equity percentage is obviously, you know, the obvious increasing your net profit, right? Um, and then also if you are um, putting money into the business, then that's going to increase your equity. So then that would mean that you would need to make turn a higher net profit too, because then both of those are going to increase. And then if um, you take money out of the business, then that's going to decrease your equity within the business. And so, you know, you're running a business. Um, what what difference, differentiates running a business, the return on equity on that versus you um, investing your money elsewhere in real estate or in stock markets, you know? So y with those kind of investments, you'll get like maybe 10 Fifteen percent, right? But with running a business, you want to make sure you get at least forty to fifty percent. Yeah, and and why do you want to make sure that that you make forty to fifty percent return on equity? Because there is a lot of risk to owning a small business, and you want to be paid for that risk. Um, and it's important to understand that that there is that relationship when it comes to um, you know the return on on equity and risk and right um you know it's it's the reason that um we you know we like to see businesses really you know if if you pick your your niche right and and if you decide what projects you're best at working on um really take that and do what you can with that and yeah. scale with that model and invest in your business um, don't get distracted by other people doing other investments and other short-term things to try to, um, you know, <laughs> you know, try to try to get you rich, right? right. Um, yeah. You know, there's there's a lot to be said for, um, you know, looking at a five to to ten year plan within your business and continually investing, um, measuring your 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 net profit, watching your cash flow, and you know. Ultimately, you know, getting a very, very good, you know, return on your your equity, um, and it's something to to definitely focus on. Yeah. Um, you know, because you know, running running a small business, that's where you're going to get, you know, the highest return. Um, you know, so before you start to, um, you know, look look at other opportunities, just make sure that you're first optimizing what you can do within your. Right. Your business. Right. That's a good point. So before you get into any other divisions or service lines or anything, it's it's good to look at your return on equity. Make sure that this business, you're all set, you're hitting your your targets of forty or fifty percent, and then maybe you can you can move on to other business ventures and, and uh you can do the same there. That's yeah. a good point. And and you know, it's it's also important because What's going to help you grow, just as I was mentioning this during during the net profit conversation, um, is making sure that you're always continually getting a return and always holding yourself a accountable to that. Because as you get larger, it could it it does you know there there could be a sense of of complacency that um, comes into play. Uh, yeah, you know because even though you're um, you know, you're not technically in in the negative. There's still money coming in, but in in reality, you may be encountering a lot more problems and a lot more things to work through just with the volume and revenue of work that that you're doing. So, yeah, make sure that you know as your business is growing, mm -hmm. that your profits and your return follows that as well. Yeah, and you know, some of these uh, the key performance indicators that we went over today. It, it really helps you make those important business decisions, you know, all the way from, you know, the net cash flow. Do I need to tweak my estimating? How is, how are, how well are my cash inflows covering my cash outflows? All the way to pricing with the revenue per hour, um, all the way to return on equity, like we said here. So um, I think that if you take these um, ratios here, it will help you you know, make those business decisions, but it's also good to track them over time so that you can always you you can always be tweaking them and working towards progress, right? And increasing or decreasing some of these ratios. Yeah, and it's and it's really broken down into three major parts. It's making sure that your accounting is done accurately, right, um, and correctly. Um, 
And then you're looking at on a frequent basis, analyzing that data and understanding what is actually happening within your business. Cause there's no other resource or no other place that, that you can look that's going to give you a more accurate view at how you're doing within your business right. than looking at your financial data. Yeah. Then the third part is taking action. And at Cycle CPA, we we unfortunately can't can't take the action, but what, what we try to do is look at the aspects within your financials and we try to give you a head start and look at some opportunities that yeah. you know you can you can optimize or increase efficiency and yeah. you know help with pro productivity or just kind of you know think about all of those different things that could possibly be going on within your business and then you know improving it for for the next period yeah it's important because you know when we calculate these ratios for a client it's like it they're like oh maybe i shouldn't buy that truck next month and it's like yeah because you're you're over leveraged right now or um whatever it may be and you know maybe you you're always having that headache in in the fall and winter season that you're running low on cash flow um and when we have our cash flow meetings with our clients we're able to forecast that out and tell them whether or not they're breaking even on their cash flow and how much they need to raise prices so that they're not they're not having that headache during that time and um you know they don't have to worry about making payroll and stuff like that. It's just the financial data and the, and the foundation of it is the bookkeeping and accounting work. And then you can make good decisions based off of that. Um, and another thing that I want to just bring up here is um, you should be using an accounting system like QuickBooks or Xero or uh, Sage. Um, I know a lot of it's these, a 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of these landscape management softwares are great, like Jobber, Yardbook, um, Element, but they're not accounting systems. They don't have a profit and loss, a balance sheet, a cash flow statement for you to look at. And so you may be tracking your time on there, estimating that's all good stuff, but you still want your financials because it's going to give you a holistic view um, of your of your business. Absolutely. And it's, it's been, uh, you know, we had a great time here, yeah. you know, taking over the How to Hardscape podcast. And uh, also just want to make sure that you guys are aware, um, if you use the promo code How to Hardscape, um, you can head over right to our website, cyclecpa.com, and you can get $200 off. Um, so, and that can be applied to whether you need catch-up work done within your bookkeeping or, or the ongoing services. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. Again, go check out Joe and Carla at CycleCPA.com. Mention the How to Hardscape podcast, get $200 off, or go check out their Facebook group, Landscaping Accountant, for more information and education around your financials. If you're on Instagram as much as me, Cycle underscore CPA is their handle on Instagram, so go give them a follow, give them a like, and thank them for bringing you today's episode. And we look forward to meeting you next week on the How to Hardscape podcast. Thank you.